Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Corpus Cast, the podcast all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society from Aston University. I'm your host, as always, Dr. Robbie Love. I hope you're doing well. Um, for many of you, uh, I imagine you're gearing up to start uh, a new academic year um, this September. And whether you're a student or an academic, one of the things you'll probably be thinking about sooner or later is academic writing. Maybe your own academic writing or, or thinking about how to support your students' academic writing. Now, this is a topic that we did cover um, quite a long time ago, back in episode 17 uh, with Dr. Kevin Jiang. Today, we're returning to this topic, but in the context of learner corpora, which is our main topic for today's episode. A learner corpus, uh, quite simply, is a corpus made up of text produced by learners of a language. And my guest today will share how she uses learner corpora to help uh, university students write in English, uh, specifically when it's their second language. And of course, that's um, an awful lot of students uh, who are in, in that boat. My guest today is Shelley Staples, professor at the University of Arizona, professor of English. Uh, Shelley has a PhD from Northern Arizona University, and uh, her research focuses on the use of corpus-based discourse analysis to investigate language use across spoken and written contexts. Uh, specifically, the purpose of Shelley's research is to understand how linguistic variation is related to situational factors and speaker characteristics, including register, first language, cultural background, uh, and proficiency levels of second language speakers. Uh, her publications include the monograph, The Discourse of Nurse-Patient Interactions, um, a very interesting topic in and of itself, but not one that we'll be covering uh, in today's episode. Uh, the edited volume, Talking at Work, Corpus-Based Explorations of Workplace Discourse, um, a co-authored book, The Register Functional Approach to Grammatical Complexity, uh, and she's very, very widely uh, published uh, otherwise as well. Uh, in journals, including Applied Linguistics, TESOL Quarterly, uh, Journal of Second Language Writing, and many others. Um, and she's also the uh, principal investigator of uh, two uh, projects that uh, will be coming up in today's episode, two learner corpus projects, which have wonderful names, Crow, the Corpus and Repository of Writing, and uh, McCaws, the uh, Multilingual Corpus of Assignments, Writing, and Speech. So, an awful lot for us to get through today. Uh, Learner Corpora, of course, a, a really, really uh, broad and, and very productive area of, uh, of research in, in corpus linguistics and, um, and language learning and uh, uh, English for academic purposes and English for specific purposes. So there's an awful lot for us to get through today. So without any further ado, uh, I'm really, really pleased uh, and grateful uh, to have Professor Shelley Staples uh, on the show. Um, a bit of an early morning for you, Shelley, but uh, thank you very much for joining us on Corpus Cast. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me, Robbie. I'm delighted to be here. It's great to get the chance to speak to you. And um, and and you are somebody that I've hoped for quite some time that we, we'd get on the show. So I'm really grateful that we've, uh, uh, that you've agreed to do it. And we found some time to, to make this happen, despite the um, not insignificant time difference uh, between <laughs> us. So uh, thanks once again. Um, and I really want to, you know, sort of get inside your mind a little bit, uh, find out what makes you uh, tick when it comes to, to corpus linguistics and, and the research that you do. So I'll start with the question I always begin with, um, asking all of our guests here on the show, what does corpus linguistics mean to you? Thanks. Yeah. So as many others have probably talked about, I do see corpus linguistics as a methodology, um, but you can also see that I'm very interested in looking at a variety of language use. So um, I see it as a methodology that allows for the exploration of actual language use across a variety of situations, including speech and writing, but also more fine grained domains like uh, the ones uh, that you mentioned, healthcare communication between nurses and patients or specific genres of academic writing. Um, that's more the focus for today. And I also see it as uh, both a quantitative and qualitative method for discourse analysis um, that can be extremely useful for informing language teaching. And that's a big part of my work as well, is, is seeing how we can apply the findings from corpus linguistics to that domain. I, I'm always really interested to hear um, from, from researchers in this field how they got into corpus linguistics because it's not something 
um, that necessarily has has a great deal of visibility when you're growing up and going to school and thinking about what you might want to do with your life in the future. So, tell us a, a, a bit of you know about your story. How, how did you end up um, becoming uh, a professor uh, and a researcher in, in corpus linguistics? What's what was your journey? Yeah, so I very much came to corpus linguistics as a classroom teacher. So I think that's a lot of why I'm really interested in bringing it back to the classroom. Um, I was a lecturer for uh, almost 10 years before I got my PhD. And it was then that I got exposed to corpus linguistics. I always tell my origin story as seeing Doug Biber speak at TESOL. Uh, in 2004, a long time ago, <laughs> um, and then just really getting excited about all the research that was coming out. I was reading a lot in Jeep and ESP Journal because the context of my teaching was very much EAP and ESP. Um, and so from there, um, you know, I tried things out in my classroom trying to bring corporate into the classroom through things like LexTutor, um, and then eventually committed to the field and um, applied to a few schools, but NAU was definitely my top choice, and I was excited to go and work with Doug, but also with Randy Reppin. So um, I had been really inspired by the work that she was doing and continues to do, um, translating corpus research uh, for the classroom. So you, you, you've sort of that's under the the learning tree, I suppose, of, uh, of of researchers who have you know done so much uh, in the field, and, and you yourself as someone who has done quite a lot of different things. You mentioned the uh, nurse patient interactions earlier. That's a whole other episode that we could uh, uh, get into all of the the, the healthcare communication uh, uh, work that you've done as well. But but for today, um, uh, we, you've mentioned already um, your interest in, in language learning and. We're going to focus in on your use of learner corpora um, in the context of second language or L2 uh, writing. Um, so I, I suppose let's, let's kind of set the scene and, and, and think more about the kind of context that you typically work in in, in your research in, in this particular area. Um, are we talking about uh, students at universities who are writing in, in English as a second or additional language? And what, what what sort of point in in the journey are you particularly interested in in applying uh, corpus methods to to try to help them? I suppose. Yeah, so um, this was definitely where I got my start working. Actually, mostly with international graduate students, but also uh, academic professionals that were working. So very high level. Um, since then, uh, uh, actually at that time too, I was also working with undergraduates at the very beginning of their undergraduate careers. And that's where I've focused um, my research and the corpus building for Crow um, more recently. And so um, when I uh, think about these students, um, these are generally um, international students coming from a variety of countries, um, but still commonly China, Saudi Arabia, um, at U of A, where I work, we also get a number of students from Central and South American countries, particularly Mexico, because we're very close. Um, they're generally interested in uh, developing academic literacy, including academic writing, um, and they want to be successful in a variety of careers. And so this context is also kind of specific to the U.S., where we have a lot of general education requirements as part of our undergraduate degree, unlike a lot of countries. And so this, this uh, context is called first year or foundations writing. Um, and students are required to take this regardless of their language background. So that's another thing. It's um, we sometimes we have kind of parallel courses uh, that students can choose if they're international or um, second language writers, uh, but they follow the same kind of sequence as um domestic students would take. So it's a little different than like a pre-sessional or um, additional course that they were taking. Um, and so these students are in this particular corpus, the Crow corpus are definitely high intermediate to advanced learners, um, but they're working on academic writing skills. Um, some of the research that I do is very relevant, I would say for first language English users as well. And so, um, 
that's something that I look at as well. Um, but the academic socialization processes are a little different for these students coming from other countries. So, so this is this is a uh, a, a separate kind of module that that the students are taking, which is not. Uh, about the disciplinary content of what they're studying on their course at university, but rather specifically and, and solely interested in how, how to write in the academic context, right? Exactly. Sometimes they get a little bit into those disciplinary writing practices. So there are opportunities for them to kind of research and explore what those are in majors that they're interested in. But actually in the U.S., students don't have to come in having declared a major and like I said, they have these general education requirements. So regardless of their major, they're actually going to be taking classes in a variety of disciplines. And so we're trying to prepare them for that experience as well as their writing in their major. So we'll, we'll go into more detail about Crow in a moment, but I think it would probably be helpful for, for listeners who maybe uh, are not so familiar with with the broader kind of idea behind um, the, the approaches that, that you take in your research um, what, what, <laughs> I'm going to ask you bluntly, but what, what can a, a corpus linguist do to help, right? Uh, if we're thinking about learner corpora, uh, particularly, um, what, you know, what is the, the broad kind of rationale behind, um, building a corpus, uh, in this context and, and what is the, the, the kind of ultimate aim in terms of how it may help these students? Yeah, so I do think I take a slightly different approach to learner corpora than than some others have. Um, I definitely am still looking for places for improvement for writing, um, but I also see that these texts in and of themselves are representative of the writing context that the students are working in. And so because of that, I'm also kind of mining it as you would any corpus. So I'm looking for pattern, lexicogrammatical patterns that are common in the types of assignments that students are doing in this context. And so they're able to see what language um, is commonly used. They can actually make decisions if they want to use that commonly used language or if they want to kind of depart from that. So that's a very much a part of the pedagogy that goes on in these classes is kind of helping students to make um, rhetorical and linguistic choices um, but the corpus assists in that, in that it's able to show students this is what is going on in these texts. We look at not only concordance lines for fine-grained um, examination of, you know, linguistic features, but also larger portions of text. So students will do text analysis on the discourse level to kind of see what are the major moves within these types of assignments. And a lot of this is also... Um, in the service of building their genre awareness, which is a big part of the pedagogy in this context, is um, kind of helping students to see what genres are, what are some of the conventions, which is where the language comes in. Um, and then in this way, they can apply that to new genres that they might encounter later on in their academic uh, studies. So this, this does sound uh, somewhat different to, to what what I've sort of typically encountered with with how researchers approach learner corpora, um, often in in uh, learner corpus research, you you hear about you know error tagging and and identifying uh, what what researchers do do literally call errors and and trying to to help students to to find out what to avoid doing or, or what to change. But it, it sounds like um, it it sounds like this 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 is a bit of a, a different approach where it's it's more about uh, I suppose, enculturing new members of, of a community into what the reality of <laughs> this, the, 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 the discourses are, I, I suppose, rather than thinking about here's what you're technically doing wrong, rather in, instead it seems that you're in, using it as a way to introduce students to a, to a, a writing uh, or a discourse community. Am I sort of going along the right lines here? It, it does seem to be quite Definitely. an approach to this. Yeah, definitely. That's that's exactly it. And not to say that we don't look at, you know, a more effective and less effective language within this context. Of course we do. But I think by bringing in these texts that are more relevant um, to the learners, they're able to see uh, what's possible. And also by using student texts, it also shows that their writing is 
is worthwhile. Um, I think a lot of times in these contexts, students just feel like, oh, I'm writing this. There's no point to it. But I think connecting them to this larger group of writers um, shows them the value of what they're doing. Um, it also can, again, be more relevant in terms of like the topics that are being covered. Um, that's where it's nice that we have students from a lot of different uh, cultural backgrounds. So um, they can find, you know, p potentially topics that are more of relevance to their own lives. Um, so, yeah, that's a lot of it. So so tell us more about um, Crow then, the, the, the corpus and, and repository of writing, what, what we're discussing here. Um, how, 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 you know, what are the, the specifications, so to speak? How, how big is this corpus and, and uh, how long have you been developing it? Is this something that you're still kind of adding to with, with more students writing year on year? Tell us a bit more about what, when, if, when, when you're um, showing new students uh, this corpus data, what are they actually kind of getting their hands on? Yeah, so it's a corpus of first year writing from three institutions currently. So um, University of Arizona, where I'm mm -hmm. at, Northern Arizona, where I was, and Purdue University, where I was previously to U of A. Um, we actually also have a repository of teaching materials that go alongside the corpus, and some of them are actually directly linked to the corpus text, meaning that it's from the same instructor whose students have submitted to the corpus. So you can see a lot more of the context of what these assignments are. There are 32 assignment types in the corpus. So there's a lot of variation actually, which uh, again, a lot of people kind of think of this context as, oh, we're just writing argumentative essays, but there's a lot more going on in it. So I like that part about it. Um, and I actually kind of started this with Randy at NAU. We had a small corpus um, from the NAU writing program that we used for um, some research. Um, but really, it was when I went to Purdue and I had these amazing graduate students that really wanted to have some kind of database that could be shareable across um, the graduate student population and um, be able to be used by many researchers. And that's really the spirit of it is being able to share this data with other researchers that are interested in this context um, currently, we have 18,000 um, texts, uh, so over 18 million words are in the corpus, um, and it's definitely still growing. So I actually just, like this summer, added uh, another batch, um, and we're doing that um, pretty much every year we're adding to the corpus. So uh, it also becomes a site for students to learn about corpus linguistics and corpus building. So I have a um, lab where... Um, I invite students to participate in the process of the corpus building. So it's also a learning site. And then finally, I just want to say um, about my amazing research team, uh, which, you know, this sort of started again at Purdue University with a colleague, Bradley Dilger, who's from rhetoric and composition. So not a corpus linguist at all. But we saw that we were kind of trying to do similar things in making um, these um uh, materials available to researchers. And so it's been a really generative um, research site to allow uh, me to also learn about um, the field of rhetoric and composition a bit more and bring in some of the uh, perspectives um, from their, their approach to my research and to the team as well. So you, you're adding to it year on year uh, and it's, it's growing. Um, how do you it's it, it's 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 really interesting how do you uh recruit i suppose participants is is it a case where there's kind of an, an opt in or an or an opt out situation um as i imagine that for some students the idea of somebody taking their their essay um particularly if maybe they weren't very happy with it or they were disappointed with the grade they got um they might feel a little bit uncomfortable about that if they know that future students are going to be pouring through it and, and reading examples. So um, how, you know, what's the kind of uptake, you know, how, how popular is it? How easy is it, I suppose, to... Yeah, so it's... it's give, them, give you their data, right? Yeah, it's really varied depending on the institution. So at NAU, we had actually 
um, the students had to submit a final portfolio as part of the class. And so there was at the time that I was there and when we started collecting the corpus um, and, and opt in opt in so students would sign a consent but it was kind of a blanket consent to use their papers for any research um, so they would you know they would have the choice to do that um, and then at Purdue it was opt out so that's why we have so much data from Purdue is that um, we basically in, and in both cases we were work all the cases were working closely with instructors as well they're a huge part of the ability for us to gather the data. So at Purdue, it was more, mostly like if the instructor opted in, then we would have the data from their class, but we would follow up with the students, let them know this was happening with their texts and give them the chance to opt out. Um, at Arizona, we are going physically and you know digitally <laughs> into all of the classes. So we have to get assigned consent um, one way or another, online or in person, for each student. Um, so that's a lot more labor intensive. Um, but it's nice because I've been able to interact much more closely with the students who are who are contributing to the corpus. And um, interestingly, um, they they don't seem too concerned about the quality of their own papers, but they actually sometimes want to um, have you know some kind of ownership of that as well. So in recognition of that, because we de-identify all the papers, we, we remove um, the names, um, we assign numbers that are not related to any kind of student number, um, because we use also, we have a lot of metadata associated with the papers, um, including things like TOEFL scores, but also, you know, language background, that kind of thing. Um, so for students that kind of wanted that ownership, we actually, and to recognize that they're contributing to this project, we actually created a student um, contest, essay contest. And so uh -huh. for, yeah, for students that participated in the corpus, we had, we invited them to um, submit like their favorite paper. Um, and then we had a little, you know, adjudication amongst the team and we awarded uh, prizes, um, monetary, uh, but also they were able to get published with their name and with their bio on our blog. So, you know, we try, we're trying to kind of balance out the need for this to be anonymous versus recognizing students um, writing in this way. And so you, you've been working on this for, for a few years now and, and using it uh, with your each batch of uh, first year uh, students. Um, I guess the obvious question is, you know, what 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 has been the reception? What sort of feedback or, or evidence of, of how useful it's been, you know, have you received from, from the students who've been using the data? Yeah, so we've actually, we've been working on um, now a four year project, I guess, that's uh, really looking at the impact of some of the materials that we've been able to develop from the corpus. And so that allows us to kind of see a little bit more um, firsthand the impact. We also have perception data from both um, the students and the instructors. Um, and it was interesting, I think, um, you know, when we started, we weren't sure what the students' reception would be. Would they think, oh, why are we looking at other students' papers? But actually, um, from the survey data that we've gotten, there's been, so we've had, you know, at least like 250 um, survey responses in terms of the effectiveness of this um, from the student perspective. And only one student out of all of those said, I don't think we should be using student data. So <laughs> it's definitely very, very gratifying to kind of see what we thought that students would um, really respond to this as these are peers and I'm learning from my peers. Um, and they say things like, you know, it's really helpful to see these assignments and contexts. Um, and I also do work with another corpus that is not this high level, right? So you might think, oh, okay, this is, this works for this high level student. Um, but I, but I also, uh, the other corpus um, cause that you mentioned at the beginning 
is much, it starts from like the 101 level for Portuguese and Russian. And those students too, they see the um, student texts as uh, very relevant to their lives. They call it real world language, which I think is really interesting because these are again, student assignments from those classes, but they see it as relevant because they're talking about topics that are you know coming up in their classes, but also related to their everyday lives. Um, for the teachers, I think they also see what we've done with the um, materials is really try to align them with the course learning outcomes. And it helps that I'm very steeped in the first year writing. Um, and then I have uh, for the other corpus, I have graduate students that are teaching those classes. So they everybody's like really aware of what is important in these contexts um, so we're able to create materials that really support the learning go goals more broadly, um, and teachers are seeing that as well. And then with the research and um, being able to see sort of what are some of the developments, we've been able to see um, students developing skills, in, you know, sort of de developing genre conventions, um, like I was talking about earlier with the language that they're using. Um, seeing if it's appropriate to the genre and also thinking about the larger um, kind of discourse moves that they are um, able to see in the corpus and then apply to their own writing. Oh, yes. So I, I wanted to pick up on that because it was really um, reassuring to hear that that only one of the students you know, said that they weren't so uh, happy or, or maybe didn't think it was such a good idea uh, to look at students writing out of 250. That's that's not so that's not too bad, I don't think. Um, but I, I, I guess this is, you know, perhaps for, for, for uh, academics at other universities who might be uh, hearing this and going, oh, this sounds like a, a great idea. Maybe I could uh, start to do something similar with my own students in, in my own context or, um, or or maybe otherwise, you know, they, they already have experiences that are, that are similar. Uh, certainly in my case, you know, I've, I've had concerns in, in my teaching where uh, students want to see previous examples of, of students' essays from the same module in previous years to get an example of what a successful uh, response to the assignment looks like. Absolutely a reasonable thing to ask for. But then, of course, there's always a, a slight concern about plagiarism, right? I know it's an obvious an obvious question, but does does that sort of concern kind of emerge? And, and is there a conversation to try to kind of mitigate against the risk of students inadvertently or otherwise using the, the Crow data kind of inappropriately or, or kind of relying on it too much in a way? Yeah, this is a great question because this comes up a lot. So I work a lot with teachers, not only at my institution, but I've started doing what we call Crow Fellows, uh, wow. which is actually involving teachers from uh, other institutions and using this data in their, so same context of, the, of this first year writing. And that's been really gratifying because we can see that actually what we're doing and what we have in the corpus is is relevant for these other contexts and other institutions. But this is definitely a question that comes up a lot. And so that is part of the conversation that happens within that um, fellow space. So it's a group of teachers that are working. Um, they're learning often about corpus linguistics for the first time. Um, and so they've been, they also have these concerns because like you said, many teachers use models in their classroom, but they, you want to make sure that, you know, it's not just a matter of a student copying from that model. And I do think actually using a corpus is, is a way to get a little bit around this because then you've got multiple um, models. And I think that's really the key with using models is to have a variation so that students see that there's not just one way to do an assignment, if it becomes like, oh, everybody's doing it this way, then it becomes more formulaic. But if you can um, show them models where there are different pathways to achieving effective writing, then it actually enriches their idea of what effective writing is. And then they can also see, oh, I don't have to do it this one way. Um, I think with the corpus examples too, sometimes, yeah, we, we do see a pattern, but then having conversations around, okay, so where would you use this pattern? Why, why would you use this pattern? What is the function of the language being used here? And then I, I love this example, so I'll share it again. I've shared it a lot of times, but 
we we work with a literacy narrative is one of the assignments in this context. And so, of course, first person is the is what people usually use. But one of the students in the classes, um, you know, saw that everybody was using first person. So they're like, oh, I'm going to try and use third person in my narrative and see how that works. Yeah, I know. So it's like just because you see these patterns and people doing it a certain way doesn't mean that you have to make that choice. And that's where the instructor, of course, uh, plays such a huge role in terms of making it a conversation with the students rather than the students just thinking, oh, everybody's doing it this way. So that's what I have to do. That's that's reassuring to hear in a way, because I, I think, I mean, academic integrity is, you know, a, a, a tale as old as time when it comes to higher education, but but obviously these days with uh, developments in generative AI, it's it's getting even becoming even more of a, a kind of visible concern around around the role of um, uh, plagiarism and, and the use of others' data. Um, I know we're going slightly off piece here, but I, I, I guess I wanted to ask you your, your thoughts on this. Um, I, I by, by kind of sort of pulling back the lid in a way and and not just giving what you might traditionally do, as you said, just give one or two examples maybe of the models. And so here's a couple of previous ones that got high grades and there you go. And then that kind of might restrict students. You're kind of opening up to lots and lots, as you said, I think 18,000 uh, examples of, of previous uh, uh, submissions and, and previous essays. Um, the, the, the rise of AI and, and the... The ways in which students are obviously, as everyone else is, kind of becoming more and more aware of, of how easy it is to access these tools. Um, do you think that this helps maybe to um, not necessarily put them off kind of using AI, but but having this resource which is really specifically designed for them and contains only and exactly the sort of writing that they might want to take inspiration from? Do you think this is a, a valuable kind of alternative? Um, than if there's not really anything specifically for them and students might feel tempted more to go off and, and use uh, AI tools, which might help, but might cause some problems depending on how they use it. Yeah. So, I mean, my perspective as a writing teacher is, you know, AI is a tool and students are going to use it. So, but they also need to learn how to use it well. Right. And so I think that, that actually the corpus can help them um, because one of my concerns is um, students not being aware of a genre or, you know, a particular type of discourse. And so they're not able to evaluate what AI is producing for them um, in really, you know, critical, important ways. And so I'll mention this project because it, it was um, um, something that a member of our research team is, I think, currently working on. <laughs> so this is, her name is Wendy Gao. She's uh, a researcher in China, and she teaches a class uh, for students developing cover letters and resumes. And so what she's been doing is kind of showing students what the corpus, and she she actually developed her own um, subset of, of Crow that's not available on the Crow website, um, but that she is kind of training them to kind of understand the, the um, genre conventions. And then when they go to the AI tool, they can, and they ask it to produce something, they can evaluate it so much better. And so I think that's one way in which we can see these kinds of tools working together, um, because we know that students are going to use them. And I don't, feel like, you know, an all out ban makes any sense. Um, but I think, yeah, developing that critical awareness, I think that's kind of where we're at, at least at this stage uh, of our understanding of, of, of what students might be able to do with it. And so I think the corpus can actually help with that awareness. I, I think you make a, a, a really good point in that, you know, it, this is not something that you can, uh, ban away or, or expect uh, people, students included, not not to be using. But um, I suppose, you know, there, you, you've got a really compelling argument for, is what one, you know, not my perspective, but playing devil's advocate, somebody might ask, well, increasingly, what's the point in having these, uh, having corpora that we're building separately when it's all, you know, some sort of mythic idea that it's all just going to be in a large language model. And so, but I think you make a really strong case 
in favor of the value of having these dedicated uh, repositories of, of, in this case, the essays that students can access, which is tailored to to represent exactly the, the discourse community that you're kind of uh, welcoming them to in a way. So I think that's um, certainly reassuring for, for me and hopefully for other corpus builders too, that they're not out of a job yet. Uh, <laughs> not going to be replaced by the, the LLMs. Um, I think I, I wanted to, to, to ask about, um, you mentioned Crow and the, the sort of public access to the, to the text as well. Um, so this is this is uh, the the, enti- the entire corpus is is available to, to public. It is so, but it's not completely public because you mm. have to go through um, an application form, and this is where we have seen more and more people wanting to use it for AI. And so we are uh, very clear about, and actually we need to be a little clearer. We have we were working on kind of a statement about using it for AI, but we we don't allow it to be just out on the web because, well, the first point is protecting these students' data, right? I mean, even though we do all the work to de-identify, we don't want it to just be out there for anybody to take for any purpose. I think, you know, also writing instructors may not want it to be completely out there without their mediation, right? Because anytime we're having students have direct access to the corpus, the teacher is mediating that. Um, and then, then with the emergence of AI, I mean, already before that, I didn't want somebody to just come and scrape the website, right? Like that was one reason why we don't have it, um, just publicly available completely. Um, and so that's become even more of, uh, of a concern, um, with these new developments. And so we have actually, um, denied access to folks that are wanting to use it for those purposes. Wow, it's uh, it's it's a new world, uh, it really in a way, isn't it? Um, but yeah, you know, I, I I think that that absolutely makes makes sense, particularly you know the the ethical aspects as well. Um, you know, I, I think I, I'm certainly seeing it at my own institution. Um, ethical regulations are are tightening up, particularly when it comes slightly different context, but but you know the the, the broad idea is the same when it comes to um, gathering texts that are in the public domain online um, for, for, for a long time, the kind of de facto approach in, in applied linguistics and corpus linguistics seems to be, well, if it's, if you, if you can, get, if you can access it without needing uh, an account or if it's, if it's just anybody could Google it, then you can just take it and you don't even have to ask. Um, that seems to at least informally kind of been just the general rule of thumb. Um, but now that seems to be changing. And I think there's more, responsibility being taken and maybe partly this is in response to what we're seeing now with kind of the the logical end point of that approach i mean you know most corpus researchers are, are never you know are very rarely going to be building uh, data sets anywhere near that size it's much more of a small scale kind of local thing they're doing with text but if you take that to <laughs> the opposite extreme then you can see maybe that approach isn't actually um ethically appropriate especially when actually they're going beyond that and they're taking stuff that they absolutely shouldn't anyway and just you know <laughs> seeing if anybody's going to stop them um yeah I, <laughs> bit of a rant on that stuff but um it's i think that's yeah the- and i think it's something to be thinking about because we all want i mean i definitely want to come com- uh to um to contribute to open data science, right? Like that's part of the project's goal is to be able to share this data with people that want to use it. But I think with that becomes a response, becomes a responsibility to treat the data ethically. Right. And so that's where I'm so glad that, you know, when we started this project, we basically decided, yes, it's going to be free. um, But there are certain Mm -hmm. um, restraints on it. And so even like the public site, Um, we really wanted to set that up also for teachers primarily. So if, if researchers want to use the data, then we have actually a a smaller sample that we provide as an offline corpus. And so even that we've kind of curated, um, both, you know, I mean, I'd say like a big part of that is thinking about like what, what would be. Um, a good data set for research 
versus what is a good data set for teaching. And so the entire corpus makes sense for teaching because you can find, maybe you only find a few examples of a particular assignment type and that's fine for teaching, right? But for research, we want to make sure that we have enough of a particular domain in order to be able to say something about it. And so that's where we've kind of curated to um, a, a portion of the corpus for researchers. And then we make that available offline. They have to go through actually an additional training to get the offline corpus. Um, they definitely have to say they're not going to use it for commercial purposes. And even for like teaching materials, um, it's fine if you want to do that within your own class and course management system, but we don't want people publishing teaching materials from it, um, partly because we're working on that and probably going to do it, but also just um, kind of to have a little bit more control over the data. So there are things like that where we've really had to think about, okay, yes, we want this to be open, but we also feel that constraints are are useful. I think, you know, as we discussed earlier, um, this is a, a learning corpus that is not necessarily typical of um, what learner corpora uh, usually might be or what they're thought of um, uh, and, and in, in several ways, I think. And, and maybe one of them, uh, in addition to the, I think you've called it the um, asset-oriented approach we were discussing earlier and not, not sort of uh, looking at it from a, a deficit perspective so much as, you know, embracing and, and describing what, what is there and, and how and how the writing functions. But as we're, as you presumably you're going to carry on adding to this corpus in, in years to come. And from a research perspective, if it is the case, uh, as you said, that students are, whether we tell them they should or shouldn't, they're going to be using generative AI tools, a bit of a chicken and the egg uh, kind of situation, but maybe that might become uh, a data source where you may actually see <laughs> the effect that AI is having on on their writing. Yeah. Uh, some of the questions that are floating around at the moment around can a human really tell? Um, I think I'm quite good, but I know that that can't be true because the research that's out there so far is that humans are not very good at detecting AI writing. So I definitely have some kind of biases. I think I'm quite good at it because but I know that can't be right. <laughs> but um, maybe, I don't know, Is I know it sort of takes you even further away from kind of the main purpose of it, but I wonder what your thoughts are on, on whether it might be a, a place where you might see that if it is the case that students are are using such tools? Yeah, potentially. I think that's where it's helpful that we have a little bit more of the contextual information because I think for some of the classrooms, they may be very restrictive on the use of AI and not to say that a student couldn't, you know, yeah. <laughs> like it couldn't get through, but they're yeah. going to, I mean, that's the other thing with plagiarism more broadly, like there are teachers in a smallish classroom that are looking at these texts. And so people ask about, you know, before AI, people were asked about like how much of this is plagiarized. I mean, yeah. we don't know, right? We haven't mm -hmm. run it through a plagiarism detector, but mm -hmm. we trust our teachers, right? And we know that teachers are aware of mm -hmm. plagiarism, AI use, all of those things. And so they're the ones that are looking at these texts and yeah. they're going to be mediating with the student you know, the, the final product that they're producing. Now we do have drafts. So that might be something that we could even see potentially in some of the earlier drafting versus later drafting, which would be interesting to see, but then also kind of seeing what the policy is of the instructor whose students are submitting their papers, because I think that's a huge contextual factor, of course, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, a it's, it's, a really fascinating example of um, of what a, a learning corpus outside of the kind of mainstream context we see learning corpus obviously in the ELT kind of mainstream ELT context, um, and it's it's a it's a really cool example of, of um, viewing it a, a little bit differently I think, and it's it's really great to hear about this from you. We will start to to wrap up now. I'm keeping one one eye on the clock, um, but. Uh, Zooming out of the, the specific context that we've been uh, discussing, um, it's sort of piggybacking off what we were just talking about in a way. Um, what do you think uh, learner corpora in the future, you know, what, what sort of contribution do you think 
that they will continue to be able to make, or, or do you see any new um, emerging opportunities for uh, the the sort of uh, data that you work with? We've talked a lot about Crow, but but more broadly as well in your research. Yeah, maybe I'll just talk a little bit more about this asset oriented approach because I think. Yeah. Um, it is something that I'm really interested in, and I hope that people can think about with learner data more generally. Um, so this is a term that's, I think, used a little bit more in the U.S. Actually, TESOL, the organization, um, just came out with a statement about asset-oriented approaches um, towards language learning. And as you said, it's, I mean, in the very simplistic terms, it's it's kind of like shifting from deficit to um, really looking at what students are bringing into the classroom, working with, you know, the resources that they're bringing in rather than always focusing on what they don't have. Of course, we, you know, students wouldn't be in our classes if they didn't need some instruction. So it's not saying we don't instruct them, but, you know, it's kind of starting from where they are and working to um, with those strengths that are bringing in and building off of that. So I'm hoping that we can see a little bit more of that um, going on. In addition, I'm not saying we shouldn't look at errors because, you know, students need negative evidence too, but I think there's a lot more that we can do um, with these data sets. Um, of course, there's a lot more that can be done looking at um, development and especially longitudinal. We've been talking about this for a long time, but um, working more towards longitudinal data sets. And that's one of the things that has emerged from this corpus and, and actually Macaws as well, um, is that we have a certain subset of students that have actually um, submitted for multiple semesters. And so we're able to look a bit um, longitudinally at that individual development, which I think is really exciting. Um, and then also to kind of in, especially with, you know, other languages than English, kind of seeing, you know, what we can expect from students at, in, at different course levels. Um, of course, there's going to be a lot of variation because course level is not necessarily proficiency level, but kind of seeing um, how students progress through a sequence of courses, I think is really valuable, especially for, you know, teachers and administrators to understand what's going on in, in their classes. Um, so that's, you know, a little bit different than just thinking of these as markers of proficiency level as well. Um, and then I'm, I'm also excited about some of the new data collection that's happening outside of you know, the US where I am and the UK. Um, and as you mentioned, so many of the um, learner corpora are are in the EFL setting, but they are a little bit constrained, right? So um, the new uh, uh, corpus that's being built by the Lancaster group in um, English of a medium as a medium of instruction context. I've also been working with um, a scholar in Ghana um, on first year writing basically and in his context. So kind of getting out of our very heavily research uh, focused universities. I've also been working, as I said, with um, in, uh, teachers outside of those contexts, uh, specifically in the US community college instructors. And so uh, I hope eventually we can collect data from those sites as well. And there's interest on the part of teachers, but of course you have to kind of balance out the the research goals and the teaching goals. So I think there's a lot of opportunities um, still for corpus development, but then also using these corpora in different ways. Well, it, the future sounds bright and um, busy as well, by the sounds yes. <laughs> <laughs> to do, uh, which is which is always great to hear. Um, Shelley, thank you so much. We're, we're going to um, bring things to a close with just one more uh, quick question, um, which I like to ask at the end. Um, I used to ask three, um, but I realized it was maybe a little bit unduly, uh, felt like maybe a bit of an interrogation. So I've, I've taken to reducing it just to one. Um, and for you, I'd like to ask in general, um, not necessarily specifically to, to your own research context, but in general, um, for students embarking uh, on corpus research for the first time or studying corpus linguistics for the first time, what's your number one piece of, piece of advice for students who are completely new to this and studying it for the first time? 
Yeah, I think it's actually kind of going to the end of the process and thinking about the contribution and what they want to that they want to make and also maybe how they see people using the research because I think sometimes you know it happens in any field but I think with corpus linguistics we have some available corpora and so I think people sometimes get constrained by that we also have some available tools that people are constrained by and so not letting that dictate so much what you're doing, but really thinking long and hard about the contributions you want to make. I think the other thing that I would say, um, maybe a little bit more specific to learner corpora, but I think in general, just thinking about the comparisons that you're making, because, you know, so much of, of what I do and many people do is comparing across corpora. And what I've found is that, you know, if you get closer and closer to a, a real comparison, Actually, like at this level with the crow corpus, there's very little difference between the L1 and the L2 writers because we do have L1 writers in this corpus too. And so just thinking about what you're comparing and why you're comparing and what you want to get out of that. So that's kind of two things. But <laughs> Thank you. Two for one. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, well, thanks again, uh, Shelley, for, for joining us today. It's been a, a really interesting conversation and um, really appreciate hearing more about your research and, and the, the really great perspectives that you have on, on how learner corpus research may be shifting a little bit uh, into maybe a bit more of a new direction. Um, so that's it for this week's episode of Corpus Cast. In fact, this month's episode of Corpus Cast is me thinking I'm suddenly launching weekly episodes. That's not happening, I assure you. Um, but thank you for joining us, uh, our viewers and listeners, uh, on your platform of choice YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, as always, do let us know your thoughts using the hashtag CorpusCast and make sure to check out the Aston Corpus in your club on X at Aston Corpus. Uh, and you can follow me at Lovermob. CorpusCast is an Aston Mills podcast hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by my wonderful colleague, Sam Cook, um, who always brings me joy um, <laughs> and never anything else. Uh, <laughs> but have been in joke there for you. We've had some fun today uh, behind the scenes. Um, so uh, thanks again uh, to you, our listeners, um, and thanks most of all, of course, to Professor Shelley Staples for joining us today for this episode of Cast. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.